Welcome to the one within all back to another episode of Interverse podcast. And of course, I'm your host chance. Today we have back by popular demand. <laughs> the amazing Eileen Day McCusick. Last year, we talked to her about her older book tuning the human biofield. And if you've been following my podcast at all lately, or catching me as a guest on other people's shows, this is a subject that I'm highly interested in and have been doing a lot of experimentation with myself and with some other people. So it's going to be really interesting to see where Eileen's journey has taken her since the last time we talked. And she's even put out a new book called Electric Body, Electric Health, which came out earlier this year, I think in January. And that's been a phenomenal read that I've re returned to, to make reference to several times since I read it. So a lot of the questions I've got for Eileen today are going to be based on that book, but depending on how things go, we might just flow in different directions, depending on what she wants to express. I'm definitely open to anything. And in order to maximize our time, I'd like to just jump right in. But before that, I got to let everyone know that you can find all of Eileen's work at biofieldtuningstore.com, including the, uh, I believe you've got multiple websites. So I think I'm going to kick it over to you and let you give people the plugs, if you will, to all the places they can find you online before we get started. But welcome back to the show, Eileen. It's so exciting to be talking again. Yeah, thanks, Chance. It's great to be here. I really enjoyed our last talk. I actually took a lot away from it, which I don't usually from interviews. You know, you had some really interesting things to say that really stuck in my mind and were helpful. So I figured we'd get a lot out of speaking again. And where people can find me, we have a couple of websites, electrichealth.com is designed to be an introduction to the idea of electric health. It's got all kinds of info on it, educational info, and biofieldtuning.com and biofieldtuningstore.com. And the store is where you can get my books if you don't want to buy from Amazon <laughs> and, uh, and a whole bunch of tuning forks and other things that I've created. So here's the new book, Electric Body, Electric Health. I recommend people get a hard copy and the Kindle version. That way you're supporting two times. And also you can take it with you on the go because uh, the very cool thing about the book is the detailed charting of the biofield anatomy, which we'll get into a little bit of that. And we definitely talked about it last time. But before we started off, I wanted to ask you about your recent adventures. If there's anything particularly fun or exciting you want to share about all the things you're up to. I know your life is a kind of a whirlwind. Well, you know, my life has definitely been a whirlwind in the past chance, but I, I just, in fact, in the, the end of May and into the beginning of June, I had so many things going on, so many projects to complete. And I was uh, keynoting at a couple different conferences, one in person and one virtually, and everything kind of wound down all at the same time. And I really made a commitment to take some time and some space to not be busy, to not be always go, go, go and do, do, do and juggling a million things. And so I'm sort of in a period where I feel like some kind of cycle has completed and a new cycle is arising and any any waveform always begins in stillness. And so that's where I currently am. <laughs> I think it's going to be brief, but I've been really just practicing being, not planning, not feeling like I need to create or do, uh, but really just letting myself rest and be still, which is something I haven't really had the liberty to do in a really long time. And I think we're also conditioned towards super busyness, especially people like me who tend to be sort of super achievers. And there's a sense of self-worth in our productivity and our deliverables. And it, it, I feel the impulse, you know, to be like, well, oh, got to go do. Um, but I'm just letting it pass and just letting myself just kind of be, which I'm actually really enjoying. So, so my adventure at the moment isn't very adventuresome, <laughs> but it's very pleasurable. That's pretty awesome, though, because in a way that itself is like an adventure, probably to slow down and smell the roses, so to speak. And I can kind of see it in you. You do have a very calm and relaxed energy, not that you didn't before or you were manic or something. But I know you were traveling a lot. And like you said, doing a lot of keynote speaking and, of course, finishing up that book at the end of the year last year probably took a lot. So. 
I'm happy for you that you're able to kind of chill out a little bit and let the seeds you've planted sprout on their own and germinate and see where the next fruit comes from. That's exactly. pretty awesome. Yeah, that's what I'm really feeling. Just the the desire to kind of let things ripen and fall where they will without having to effort too much, you know, without without the trying and the doing. That I, I just think that we're we've been so conditioned to that. I know that I certainly was. And in my work with groups, I find this tendency to uh, this guilt driven overdoing, this need to produce. Um, it, it's very ancient, you know. It's a it, we're mentally coded for slavery and for productivity and and for an irrational amount of busyness and doing and so much of actually the work that i've done the group sessions that i've done uh over the last year that theme has come up again and again and i guess you know because i put myself in every group that i do and so i received the benefit and um and and the big part of the healing that that happened in these groups is really around this uh, this ability for self agency and sovereignty and not being so blindly programmed by uh, by our culture and by our ancestry by our history. I talk about how we've been raised in captivity for generations now, and we've lost touch with our wildness, with our essential humanness, with our own knowing. And health is really a place of getting back to that wildness, to that natural humanness. And that frenetic pace of doing um, isn't really in harmony with our fundamental humanness and wildness. Absolutely. I think that even other domesticated animals besides domesticated humans know how to chill out and relax. I look at my dog. He doesn't do a whole lot unless I start throwing the ball. And then that's something that's driven by excitement and passion, of course. So I think there's a ton of wisdom in that. And it's not necessarily human nature to be any one way, but I like to think that our nature is what we're becoming in the present moment. And what you're talking about definitely resonates with I do like a daily card draw myself uh, with three different decks. And the first card that today was from the I Ching and it was work on what has been spoiled, which is all about slowing down and tending to what is most needed, despite whether or not it is like flashy or glamorous or has some sort of end goal, just literally like sweeping and cleaning up. And, you know, with biofield tuning, it is kind of like sweeping your field. It's just like a, a chore in that sense, not in a negative way, but like just a basic thing to keep yourself going. And the second card I drew was the Ace of Discs, which is all about good fortune coming your way and just popping up out of nowhere. So I think that the message there is telling us that if we just do the small things to take care of ourselves, the, the good big opportunities will still come out, even if we're not frantically searching for them. And then the third card was Blue Heron, which is a, uh, Native American animal medicine deck. And it came out in the uh, reverse, which is all about self-reflection gone awry. So sometimes in those periods of not doing a lot, or actually in either period, self-reflection can be uh, a great tool, but it also can be self-criticism, harshly judging yourself for not getting enough done. And I actually in June, I was definitely the same way. Maybe it had to do with those eclipses that happened back to back and that mercury retrograde energy, but I slowed down a lot and uh, feeling like things are really popping off now again in July. But yeah, this is a very interesting direction to go about how the uh, stillness is where things come out of. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of us are conditioned to never go to the stillness. And so it's uh, it is, it's an important place to be. The metaphor of the, you know, the monarch butterfly, the but, the butterfly always comes to mind that you kind of have to go through a period of goo <laughs> and surrender to that. And I agree, June was a really heavy month. It it really was. There was just a lot of heavy energy, those eclipses and Mercury retrograde. And a lot of people that I spoke to were just feeling like, oh, my God, I feel so low G and I can't seem to get out of it. And uh, you know, I said, didn't this just be there because it's not forever. It will change. And um, yeah, and the, the idea of, of 
you know, clean. That's one of the things that I've been doing, actually, is sort of, you know, cleaning junk drawers, <laughs> getting into all of those kinds of cleaning details that in a busy life that, you know, you neglect over and over again. Uh, I have a motto that when in doubt, clean. You know, when you don't know what to do with yourself, when you're in an impasse, when you're confused, when you're stuck, when you're just, you know, not in a good space, if you really take the time to bring a new level of order to the space around you, um, by the time you come out the other side of that, you generally feel better and you also know what it is you need to do. So there is definitely something to be said, yeah, about attending to the spoil. <laughs> That's a funny way of putting it, but I'm just thinking of this sh this group of shelves that I have that was total chaos. And I was able to like, oh, it's time to clean that, you know, and it felt so good to do it. <laughs> Everybody's got at least one drawer that's just filled with stuff they hate. <laughs> and it's pointless to be there. It's just a waste of space. And I love what you're saying. I think that that's a great motto because our living space is kind of a fractal reflection of our psychic space, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. As within, so without. Now, I talk about how the biofield is like an exploded view of the body. Whatever is going on in the electricity of the body is also going on in the magnetic field. And that's the magic of biofield tuning is that we can shift the way electricity is flowing through the body by manipulating the magnetic field. And so if our field is an exploded view of our body, our, our home is an exploded view of that. That, that what is going on around us is going to reflect what's going on inside. If we have a lot of uh, undigested emotions, if we have a lot of backlog of stuff we haven't really dealt with, we're going to have piles of clutter around us. And we're not going to have the energy to bust that clutter because the energy to bust that clutter is tied up in your field. It's frozen and it's not in flow. But one of the things that people always report to me after tuning is that they go home and they they clean out closets, they get rid of stuff, they just bust clutter because now the energy is no longer hanging out in their field, it's circulating. So now it's no longer hanging out in a pile in their home, being a reflection of that heaviness. That is really cool because nature is the same way. When something, when nature is like operating properly in ecosystem, then if there's some, something gets killed, you like see, I don't know, roadkill on the side of ro the road near a forest. You drive back the next day or two days later and it's basically all cleaned up. Nature does always like target those clutter spots really quickly with the exact right needed measure to uh, return that energy back to the flow and circulation of the whole ecosystem. And actually this is very related to a quote that I had written down from your book that was shared in my telegram group uh, by somebody in there. And there was a discussion about this quote, which was cool. We talk about your, your uh, work a lot in there, actually. And so you say that modern humans have become disconnected from the rhythm of nature as we've synced our lives to artificial accelerated rhythms. Our lives have sped up and so have our bodies. Our heart rates have increased. Our brain waves have accelerated too. Life on Earth, including the human brain, has organized itself to the tune of the Schumann resonance, the organizing background rhythm of the ionosphere. That frequency is 7.83 hertz. It's the frequency of our brain waves when we're writing on the alpha beta brainwave cusp in a state of presence, awareness, and quiet mind. But when we're writing the frequency of the thinking mind, which is in the high beta range of 13 to 16 hertz or more, we are in the accelerated electrical activity of the monkey mind that does not shut up. This is the very definition of stress. When you're under stress, your brain waves are accelerated, your nervous system shifts into fight or flight, and your heart rate speeds up and your blood pressure is higher. That is not a state of flow. That's not a state of blissful connection to nature and all that is. And that was a long quote to, to read all out, but I feel like it was all very pertinent. And I wanted to expand on the flow state a little bit. And if you had any current pertinent insights into how to drop into the flow state, like even during something that might be considered boring and anti-flow state like chores, like cleaning up. Well, music comes to mind for that. <laughs> There's nothing like putting on a good, you know, high energy music that you like to sing to, to do chores. So certainly music and, and song is a great way to enter into flow is by very nature, it is flow. So, um, you know, and our beings are musical. If, if, our, if everything in our inner symphony is in harmony, 
then that just becomes our experience, whatever we do. Uh, very few people have the luxury of that experience because the, our culture is so sick and so twisted and so distorted. There's so many signal jammers present that stop us from entering into that connection with nature. Um, but as far as dropping into a flow state, I think that we really just want to need to get out of our heads. So many people that I work on, I find that they're sort of, there's a head that's sort of disconnected from the body. The body is filled with feelings. And if you don't, if you were never taught what to do with your feelings, if you were only taught to suppress or repress or avoid or resist your emotions, then all of those emotions that got generated in you that didn't get expressed are all floating around in the body. And so the body isn't a comfortable place to be. And we end up with a hyperactive mental body instead. It's very, very common in our culture that we, when we speed up and we amplify the mental body, it overrides our experience of the emotional body. And so many people end up in this place where they're thinking their feelings frenetically in, in their head instead of allowing their awareness to just drop down into their body and feel and feel because our feelings are what keep us healthy. Just like your physical sense of touch alerts you if something's hot so you don't get burned. Our emotions are the same thing. They're, they're there as imprints and in, you know, messages really to, to keep us healthy. That's what they're designed for. And if we're always overriding them, we're going to end up in poor health. And we're definitely not going to experience that flow state. You know, I find it really interesting, and this is maybe something you've come across as well, Chance, that <clears throat> up until just a couple hundred years ago, the, the center of consciousness was never seen as being in the brain. It's only, I think, since we've had widespread literacy and this tendency to string words together uh, in our minds that we've lost our connection to our bodies. Previous cultures saw the center of consciousness in the heart or in the solar plexus. And there's a lot of new age uh, talk about dropping into the heart and living from the heart. In my work of exploring the body, bouncing sound off the body and listening to it, I became extremely intrigued by the liver and, and really the whole solar plexus because people talk about, do you go with your head and what you think, or do you go with your heart and what you feel? I like the idea of going with the gut and what you know and keeping your orientation of self more in the region of the solar plexus. If you had the opportunity to go to a single individual for for counsel or or an entire council of people for counsel what would you do I, I personally would like to go to a group and and our our organs of digestion our kidneys our liver uh our our small intestine you know, the small intestine looks like a brain there's so much intelligence here the heart can be very childlike um, the brain goes off into the future and in the past and sees things through filters and is very confused, but the gut knows. And so I like to keep my center of awareness in my solar plexus and the idea of the, of the inner radiant sun of the electric body that is fractal to the sun in our solar system, to the great central sun my electric body is, you know, we're all drops of sunlight. We're all drops of light. And our sense of radiance, our sense of electrical connection, really inner illumination, all comes from down here, <laughs> not up here, not even, there's a, a hyperfixation on the pineal gland that I don't really think is necessary in this idea that it's spiritual. I think that what we really want to be is fully human and fully embodied in our human bodies, because this is where the magic is. Not in trying to get up and out, not in trying to limit ourselves to one color of the rainbow that we are, but experience ourselves as full spectrum embodied human beings coming from a radiant core. And that is what gets you into the flow state. 
just like the sun moves around the universe and everything in nature is in a state of flow when we're attuned to the center of our being and our inner light and we're not thinking and we're not out of balance and and we can breathe into that place and feel that sense of radiant connection with all that is that's a state of inner unity that leads to an experience of flow in our world i'm really glad you <clears throat> really glad you got into that because it was one of my questions um, on whether or not you want to try to be heart centered with your consciousness or in the solar plexus because you do talk about that in the book and I found that very interesting and it's true that the flow state is not something that requires thought like dancing is the perfect example if you're ever actually being moved by the, the music you're not thinking about the next move you're going to make and this also reminds me of, I have a great grandmother-in-law and she's in her mid nineties and she's super healthy, still lives by herself, still drives around and is not getting any kind of like dementia or anything. And she's even outlived one of her children. And when you ask her like, grandma, what do you do about feeling sad or, you know, all the things that bring people down? Why are you so healthy? And she'll say, well, honey, when some kind of sad thought comes into my mind, I just don't think about it too much. <laughs> and I've noticed that that, like uh, some people might say that that is like repressing something, but in my mind, it's more like you're not feeding it because I think we can choose our thoughts. And, you know, there's a lot to unpack about the um, speech you just gave. And one of the things has to do with um, how somebody, can feel their emotions in their body and get them out of their head. Cause I have talked to people about this who've told me, well, actually I don't feel any correlation to emotion in my body. It's all mental. And I think I'm just different. I think that what you're saying doesn't apply to me. And for me, it's just mental and I'm okay with that. Is there anything you could say to speak on getting the thoughts out of the mind in terms of some kind of practice or, or way of, Man, I don't want to say way of thinking about it because we're trying to stop thinking. <laughs> well, you know, I've actually been recorded with a EEG, you know, multi-point EEG net, uh, with my brainwave staying in alpha for four minutes at a time. Not no thought. I can sit for for minutes at a time without having any thoughts at all. Um, I my brain got conditioned to do that through biofield tuning, because my practice is one of deep listening, where when I'm working with somebody, all of my attention, I'm in that, that sort of alpha brainwave state of listening and paying attention. And so, so I can switch my brain into a listening state super easy. And I think that it requires training. I, I think the simplest way to stop thinking is to listen to listen to the birds, to listen to music, to pick a single tuning fork and activate it and just listen to the sound go all the way down. That, that we, you know, there's a big problem in our culture is people don't listen to each other. Everybody's so in the, the words and the da 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 that, that to go really quiet inside and to listen deeply, um, you know, it's kind of a lost art. So, I think that's the simplest way, really, is just go outside and listen to the birds. Go sit by a brook and listen to the water. Just bring yourself into a state of present awareness by listening and just keep coming back to listening and listen and breathing in and being and, and letting all the cells in your body enjoy that quiet. Because every thought we think is radiating through our entire body, the quality, the coherence, the, the vibe of that thought is influencing ourselves all the time. And we go into a state of rest and repose when, when the mental body just stops, <laughs> it just stops. And, and we have the opportunity to just breathe and be. And the more we can bring ourselves into that place of just breathing and being in the present moment, um, the, the better our body is gonna be able to handle stress. 
because it's not subjected to the relentless stress of a crazy mind that's always <laughs> doing something like that. So I, I don't think it's an easy thing to do. I think that in my observation with thousands of clients, it seems to be the biggest undoing for everyone because very often people's thoughts are unkind. I, I, I see that we have this sort of epidemic of inner critics that like to give shit and beat up and you know really hit home how unworthy we are and so here we have these incredible minds that can do amazing things with intention and really we're magical beings we really are and we're using the power of our own minds to beat ourselves up which is this incredibly tragic waste because once you start to understand the power of the word the creative power of the word you realize you don't want to use it for anything else other than love, kindness, creativity, um, encouragement, like appreciation, that, that everything heals and grows in love. That's it. We cannot abuse or punish or berate ourselves into a state of health and well-being. Like try taking care of your plants that way and see what happens or your pets. It was when we love ourselves, our, our human beings, our human experience that we heal and that we grow. And that's really simple. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. It, it's so, so simple that the way that we achieve health is by living as much as possible in a state of love, self-love, life, love, other love, <laughs> And that's, again, in a world like this, really, really hard to do. It, it isn't a flip, a switch that we flip. We don't just go from being like, ah, to being like, oh. And so many people are looking for that chance. I know I spent many years looking for that quick fix, that instant enlightenment, um, you know, that, and, and that, the, that's a blind alley because <clears throat> learning to love ourselves and love life is a is a daily practice that you get better and better and better at the more you go but it isn't an instant thing because that self-hatred hatred and self-loathing is so deeply embedded in our collective consciousness well there are two ways places i want to go from here i'm glad this is great because we're talking about questions i had without me having to necessarily ask them in the formal way right but I noticed in your book, you talked about uh, in the throat chakra section that you are being often ruthlessly um, observant of when people do this negative self-talk. And I, for one, have managed to cure myself of that too, largely. And when I do catch one of those unkind thoughts about myself pop up, I always just like zero it out and go, actually, no, I don't feel that way. And my life hasn't gotten worse because of that. Uh, but I do know people who have told me that the uh, negative self-talk is the only way they can motivate themselves to change. And I think that you're right on the money and that self-esteem is actually more important currency for being able to change than self-loathing. But when you refer to jumping on someone for, for their syntactical choices of how they self-describe, uh, what do you do? Do you have any tricks for how to do that in the tactful way? Because sometimes it doesn't go over well. <laughs> well, I think the biggest thing are I am statements. When people say things like, I am fat, I am broke, I, you know, or um, I am a victim of this disease, uh, I, I just very gently point out that the word is creative. And I used to say, I'm fat, I'm broke. I'm sick, I'm miserable. I used to say all those things. And then one day uh, it really, really sunk in that by our word, we create our life. There's a great quote that always seems to really sink in for people. It's uh, from a book called The Tongue, A Creative Force, which is a very wise little book written by a fellow by the name of Charles Cap. And he claims to have channeled Jesus uh, in different things, but this particular quote I have told my people they can have what they say, but my people keep saying what they have. And that is really, really true. I, you know, I went through this um, chance of all things with my hair 
I got a CAT scan in 2012 and a whole lot of my hair fell out. They over radiated me. This is the last time I went to a doctor. And, um, and after that, my hair was like frizzy. It really changed. And so I went through years of saying, I hate my hair. I hate my hair. And it just got worse and worse. And my son, who is very wise, he's 20 now. I talk about both my boys in my books. Um, he said to me, mom, stop hating your hair. You need to love your hair and then it will get better. And I was like, okay, you're right. Like this is a blind spot for me. And we all have blind spots like this. And so I started saying, I love my hair, I love my hair, even though I didn't, but I kept on saying it. And I actually ended up finding a good hairdresser, some better products. And, and you know, and, and it took maybe a year <laughs> to get to the place where, but my hair got healthier, it got thicker, because I gave it love. I was giving it hate and frustration. And I was putting that, I was directing that energy. I see this in women all the time, you know, like they're, I'll get to their, I'm listening to their thighs and I'm like, do you hate your thighs? And they're like, oh, I hate my thighs. I'm always directing like hateful energy at my thighs. I'm like, I can hear that in here. I can hear how your cells feel because you hate this part of your body. And so the, the, again, just coming back to love and what we say. I remember I had somebody in a class who we were going around in the introductions and she said, I have Hashimoto's disease. And I said, wait right there. I was like, who is Hashimoto and why do you have his disease? And she was totally taken aback. She was like, I hadn't really thought about that. And in that moment, she realized that she was creating that by saying it. And she took charge of her life. She absolutely, she started tuning herself. She's really, she changed her boundaries and she healed herself of Hashimoto's disease by becoming extremely aware that she was creating her own story by speaking it. And she's like, I don't wanna speak that. That's not who I wanna be. So, so just bringing gentle awareness to people. I'll even say something like uh, when people say, I am this, I'll say, well, re-say that and say, I have been this. Because when you say I am, it's so, mm, it's so creative. But when you say I have been this, then it adds a fluidity to the equation that allows it to be different in the future. So I think the more we become very, very vigilant about the fact that words are spells and they are creative and we are magicians. And the more we become mindful and deliberate and clear and innerly unified with our speech, the more powerful it becomes. And then, then our ability to materialize the things that we want, to materialize plenty, uh, just happens naturally because our word is so powerful in that way. I mean, we do it all the time. We're, we're but if we're, if we're just kind of going off with random stuff and it's not focused and it's, then, we, then it has no power. But words that come from a very centered, deliberate place, understanding the sanctity, really, of the creative power of our word, become much, much more powerful in the world. It's very interesting. It's kind of like if your word comes from a space of stillness, then that word is very powerful and creative. But if your word is uh, against the self, if you will, antithetical to the truth of who you are, which is basically infinite divine potential, then the word comes back still or null and void. So you want to speak from that thoughtless Wu Wei flow state place. And I've noticed that this is, I mean, probably obvious to anybody that there's more and more people in the world, especially I see it with like teenagers who are really quick to join, jump on the bandwagon of, I, I have anxiety. I'm depressed or I have depression and it's almost become, I shouldn't say almost, it has become a social currency to identify ourselves with these things, whether it's a uh, Hashimoto's or uh, any other way that we're self victimizing. And I love the story about your hair because I think I've been telling my hair, I hate it uh, like unconsciously for a long time, but maybe not. I mean, maybe not to the, to an extreme degree, but I've always had crazy hair. Maybe I've just been telling my hair it's crazy. 
Not that I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell my hair a different story. I actually just got a different uh, improved shampoo myself. So that's a funny <laughs> sink. But when we're talking about these sort of self-loathing energies, I wanted to return to the heart chakra and where this uh, energy of hatred is coming from. In the book, you say that hate is a tangled knot with a lot of pieces. And I'd love for you to share your insights about the way that hatred is actually repressed um, and how maybe the self-hate is just misdirected uh, from a valid version of this emotion that is totally all right to exist that maybe doesn't have the proper outlet or recognition. This is a, a sticky one. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a really good way of bringing it up, Chase. Uh, chance because yeah well I think a lot of us when we grow up I think women especially if we say I hate this we immediately get pounced on <laughs> hate is a very strong word hate is a very bad word don't hate don't hate don't hate don't, like that's all we're given we're not given anything else other than abstinence only for emotions like that and so anytime that the, emo the emotion of hate arises in us, and I've kind of broken it down that it, it's, it's a conglomerate emotion of different, of other feelings. And so one is fear, uh, one is uh, hurt, that we're hurt, and then we're angry and we're afraid, and we're also powerless. So it's when all of those four things come together, powerlessness, anger, hurt, and fear that hate happens and it's a really valid emotion to feel we you know to hate something um if we are not allowed to externalize or express or even understand why we hate something you know because you can hate something and actually work your way through that and i i had that experience with hate when I moved to Burlington, I'd never lived in an urban area and driven in an urban area before. And there are bicyclists everywhere in Burlington. And after just a few months of riding around, I was experiencing visceral hatred for bicyclists. Just, I hated them. And I, they, rah, I mean, the car would be like, rah, against the bicyclists. And I was telling some friends that I was just hating the bicyclists. I just had some incident with a bicyclist. And one of my friends took such offense. She's like, I'm a bicyclist and I'm offended by your hatred of bicyclists. And I was like, that's valid. And I don't want to feel hatred either. So I need to understand why I feel this way. Um, am I afraid of them? Yes. I don't, I never know what they're going to do. Are they going to act like a pedestrian? Are they going to act like a bike? Are they going to act like a car? I don't know. I'm afraid of them. They're unpredictable. Am I hurt by that? Yeah, because it feels insensitive to me as a driver. Am I afraid? Yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt them or hurt me. Am I powerless? I can't do anything about this. And so in, in breaking it all down and understanding it, I was like, okay, I get that I'm feeling that way, but this is part of my environment and I need to adapt to my environment. Otherwise, I'm going to be in a state of physical reaction and discomfort and that's not good for my heart or my being. So through the process of dissecting it and understanding it and pulling out the different threads, I was able to get over it, you know, and go into a place of acceptance because that's just what way it was. I mean, obviously we hate different things for different reasons and not everything is that easy to unwind, right? <laughs> but I think that it's really important that one, it's okay to hate. It's a totally natural response from the body and it's a complex response. And two, you know, what you're hating, what can you do about it? Because you don't want to keep on feeling that way in your body. We want, it is not a coherent emotion. It's a valid emotion. All of our emotions are valid, but it's a complex, incoherent emotion that really damages our health and well being. So, it, I, f I found that just like turning over stones and being willing to really understand them is very often enough to just let something heavy or difficult go because we get it. Yeah. So I think what you're describing is the proper use of thinking <laughs> where it's actual thinking, because so much of the thoughts that like, as we've described are just sort of these repetitive loops and uh, stories we tell ourselves. And what you're doing in that situation is directing your thought with the intention of getting to the bottom of something. And it probably doesn't even take very long. It's like literally just like untangling a knot. I like that you use that metaphor. 
you're just getting it straightened out again and adapting to the environment is usually the answer or coming up with a better boundary is probably required if the hatred is like revolving around a situation or a person. Uh, but one of the things you talk about in the book that I think relates to this is uh, when you say we are all born actors and actresses and can conjure up feelings of love and gratitude out of the ether. And I'm definitely someone who can do this. I actually loved in your book when you talked about the guy who said arigato a thousand times in a day. And I've been using that as a mantra just three times. Arigato, arigato, arigato. It's fun. It's actually a really fun one instead of saying thank you, thank you, thank you. But either would work. But sometimes when I suggest this to other people who are feeling kind of low voltage, I get pushback on the idea that somebody can choose how to feel. And they'll say, well, you're, you're invalidating my emotions, but, and I can't just flip a switch like you and whatever. And my, my response to that is kind of fallen short. And I was wondering, because I know that it works for me, but do you have any words of encouragement for us to share with people who don't think that they have a say in their emotional state, people that we want to be around, but we don't want um, to be constantly donating our electrons, as you put it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of a, a both this situation chance because there are times when I'm just thinking of somebody that I know who has taken a lot of hits in their life. They've sort of taken hit after hit after hit, not really through any fault of their own. And they're a little down and out at the moment. And, and it's valid that they're down and out. It, it, it's just a consequence of where their life is. And one of the things that I said to them is, you know, everything changes and, and a big important part of life is contrast. And there's all, life is very much a journey of ups and downs for every high, there is a low and, and this sine is sine wave. Yeah. It's just the journey of life. And so I think there are certain circumstances where people are genuinely low and there's not really a lot that they can do about it other than go through that experience, right? But at the same time, if you took that particular person and you got them out for an adventure and a good meal and dancing and they're around a lot of fun, they would probably be lifted because of the circumstances of their environment. Um, maybe not all, but certainly many, right? Um, so, so our circumstances, our external inputs definitely play a role. Who we're around, how they're feeling, what's going on. I mean, we don't want to be fake happy. We don't want to, um, we don't want Like spiritual what, bypassing. Yeah. We don't want to, you know, like, oh, I'm vibing high and I don't feel shame. You know, we don't want to do that. We want to be really real about how we feel. But at the same time, you're right, we can change our state. And you know what, my, my favorite word at the moment is actually appreciation. Gratitude is great. And you know, there's been so many studies done that when you regularly practice gratitude, it does improve your life. But when you think about being grateful, it's, it's kind of like a, an, like a pulling in kind of feeling, like, oh, I'm so grateful, right? But when you appreciate someone or something, there's an extension of your energy to that person. I really appreciate you and what you do and what you bring to the world. If we can move into a spirit of appreciation, I appreciate that I can get out of bed this morning. I appreciate that I have food in my fridge. I appreciate that the sun is shining. I really appreciate that bird song. To just enter into a spirit of appreciation is is a really um, sweet and, um, you know, it's not necessarily positive thinking, but it's, it's a gentle, sweet approach to life. When you are being appreciated, that brings out the best in you. Anybody or any situation that I look on with a spirit of appreciation, the observer affects the observed. And so my spirit of appreciation causes love to come forward it just does and so i think even just asking people to think about 
going forward in a spirit of appreciation, playing with that. What does it feel like to appreciate how good and cold this glass of water is on a hot day? To really deeply, deeply appreciate it. You know, those very simple things like that. Oh my God, this chocolate bar is so good. <laughs> I can definitely appreciate some chocolate. I just want to zero in on that word real quick, appreciation in terms of how it compares to gratitude, because gratitude is like being glad for what is, but think about appreciation in a currency sense and currency and our current are very related phenomenon as it turns out. <laughs> and when, yeah. what happens when your house appreciates, it becomes more valuable. So it's like by shifting that word, instead of being grateful for what is and just what is, you're actually, like you said, you're adding to it. You're bringing out more of the good. You're making it more valuable, more current or currency is coming through. So I find that to be a brilliant uh, word focus, actually. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, me too. It's been a, it's been a really great one to land on and to play with. It feels good. So uh, one other question before we get towards maybe the wrap up section, maybe we have time for two of the first hour was in your book, when you talk about your observation that the world's experiencing a turning of the ages. And I was wondering what makes you think that and what themes you see the next age or the one we're on setting being more about. And I may, we may have talked about this last time, but these answers would change, I'm sure, in short order because a lot's happened since last time. Yeah, lots happen. Well, <clears throat> I do think it does get darkest before the dawn, and that's something that seems to be going on. Um, the Aquarian age, this idea of moving from the Piscean age to the Aquarian age, the a symbol for Aquarius is like electric waves. And it is, I think, ushering in an era where we're moving from you know, just even from a medicine standpoint, from a chemical, mechanical based reality into a more, you know, the future's frequency that we're going to have better understanding of the body's electrical system of informational medicine, of vibrational medicine. Certainly sound healing is exploding at the moment. And, you know, I've been in this field for 25 years and really suffered through many years of when I told people I was doing sound healing, oh, I've never heard of that. <laughs> like just dismissed because they hadn't heard of it. Now everybody's heard of sound healing. And um, this idea of electric health, uh, somebody said to me the other day, she said, that sounds scary to me. And I said, it only sounds scary because you're not familiar with it and you don't understand it for what it is. In time, <laughs> we'll, we'll understand it. We'll know what electric health is. And that I think is, is just the, the part of the turning of the ages is moving into this uh, new way of seeing and understanding reality of, of treating reality. Certainly electric universe theory, uh, the idea that there's even plasma in space, electricity in space, even though uh, NASA at all have never really come right out and said, oh, we've discovered there's plasma in space. Because when I first started doing research for my master's thesis back in 2010, it was really, really hard to find anything about plasma or electricity out in space in any kind of mainstream publication. But over the last few years, it's kind of crept in <laughs> and, and now it's showing up without ever any kind of like declaration that it was so. Like here's solid, liquid and gas, those nebulas, they're hot gas. And now they're plasma, which I find really interesting. So there, it's already creeping into, you know, in Electric Body, Electric Health, I cite all kinds of mainstream articles and same with on electrichealth.com of the electrical nature of life. Now these have only appeared in the last couple of years. So that alone is just showing us how we're, we're moving into this, this understanding, this new way of, of looking at life, the universe and everything. And I think that, I think that it's really kind of, kind of dawn on everybody sort of all at once, sort of like when the sun rises and you're like, whoop, there's the light. I, I kind of feel that the same thing is going to happen where suddenly everybody's just going to know that we're electrical and that treating frequency with frequency makes a lot of sense. And we're just going to go that way. That's my sense. That's great. Actually, 
I loved what you said about the symbol for Aquarius being like electric waves. And that just sent me off thinking about the different signs and their symbol and how the previous age would have been Pisces. And if you look at that symbol, it's kind of like the line uh, goes out and then returns back in on itself, almost like it's regressive if you follow that. And it, it very much has felt like uh, a deep period that humanity has gone through of searching, soul searching, if you will, and going through all the darkness that regression can sort of lead us to. And that the next age being electric, I totally have seen that as well, that over the last couple of years, this has been a huge topic that's just exploding. And people, I always think that I'm going to be looked at sideways when I talk about biofield tuning as something that I'm really interested in to a, you know, a new person, but usually they're like, able to at least conceptualize why that would work maybe they've heard of singing bowls or something like that and so in a lot of ways the uh the new age things that have gotten around have definitely warmed people up to some of the now more concrete and validated information that's coming out about our subtle energy fields which is awesome and i especially like that you got into talking about plasma in that response because the only question really that i skipped from the beginning of my outline at the start of the show was about plasma and since we've got a couple minutes before we want to do uh, return to your plugs and talk about what might be coming up for you and switch to the second hour, I wanted you to maybe help us understand this other state of matter and how it pertains to our field. Because when you talk about the biofield, you refer to it as bioplasma. So what is this bioplasma? How does this other state of matter really work and flow, you know, how, despite the fact that we can't, or some of us can't see it? I guess some of us do see aura and that's a little different, but yeah, let's break down this plasma idea a little further while we've got some time. Well, plasma is just essentially the flow of electric charge. So, and it shows up in many different forms. So Northern lights, when we see Northern lights, that is the plasma in our upper atmosphere in the ionosphere, which is usually in dark current mode, meaning it's there, but it's not glowing. When the upper atmosphere gets hit with a coronal mass ejection, additional electric charge, because the solar wind isn't some hot gas blowing at us from the thermonuclear furnace of the sun. It is a stream of electrically charged particles from the electrically charged sun into our electrically charged magnetosphere that protects us from too much. It acts like a filter and a, a buffer from all of that electricity just like our own biofield does the same thing. It's fractal. So we know that the earth has a magnetic bubble around it. The sun has a magnetic bubble around it. It's called the heliosphere. It's all kind of bubbles within bubbles. And then we have a bubble around us. Anything that has an electric current running through it has a magnetic field around it. And, you know, when, when I was first coming to understand the biofield and reading about it, I, I came to see that it was the term that was used to describe the field around us, which may or may not exist, which contains, we know, electromagnetic, but then this putative subtle energy, which may or may not exist, which is the big sticky widget with energy medicine being accepted. And what I've really come to see, and I've kind of turned into a bit of a renegade in the biofield community because I've adopted a different definition. And that is that our biofield is the flow of electric current through our body and the magnetic field that surrounds it because they're two sides of the same coin. You can't just talk about the field, uh, the magnetic field without talking about the electric current. And so I've come to see the biofield as our electrical system in its entirety, which is something we never talk about. It is the flow of electricity through us. It is the fact that we exist in all states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, plasma, and ether as, as human beings. And the plasma element in us is the flow of electricity, the current, the juice that keeps us alive. And it's the difference between whether we're alive or dead. When you're alive, that electric current is flowing through you. It's powering everything, your brain, your heart, all your cells are getting all the electric juice they need to run. And when you die, your body is still there, but your light, your electric body, your plasma being has gone out. 
And the same electricity that powers us is the same electricity that powers the sun and all the stars in the heavens. All of life itself is running on electric current, electric juice, and our bodies are no different. So the idea of like, what's the energy and energy medicine and all of that nonsense is it's just electricity. And, and anything that's alive is going to have a bioplasmic weak magnetic field around it. It's just the nature of life itself. So other kinds of plasmas are uh, like lightning, uh, plasma welding, you know, anything where you see sparks or fire, um, even magnetism is a plasma because it's part of electricity. So it's really everything is a plasma when it comes right down to it. And, and everything returns to its plasma state if it's burned. Everything is basically light that's woven itself into different shapes and structures and forms. But ultimately, everything is plasma. I love that answer. And if people want to hear more about the way that the tuning forks actually affect our electric fields that first show that we did i'll make sure it's linked in the description for this one because i think that's an invaluable episode it's often my go-to first uh pick when somebody new is like where do i start with your show i'm like this is a good one <laughs> so i really appreciate getting a chance to talk again and looking forward to hour two where i'm going to get into my more weirder questions <laughs> And uh, before we hop over to that, can you let people know again where to find you? And if there's anything on the horizon other than just chilling out and seeing what comes next that they might watch out for for you to be doing? Sure. Well, you can find uh, me at electrichealth.com or biofieldtuning.com. There's also a biofield tuning store where you can purchase all kinds of sound healing key dunk. And uh, and then as far as things coming up, I don't have a ton on my calendar. Yes, you can get the sonic slider. Uh, I don't have a ton on my calendar. One thing that I have been doing is collaborating with two Australian brothers by the name of the brothers Corin, Isaac and Torold. And the three of us have created a body of work called Sing the Body Electric, where we brought together their background as vocal coaches and entertainers and people who are really dedicated towards helping people who don't believe that they can sing to sing. And I think that singing is one of the best ways to raise your voltage, to improve your health, especially singing with other people in a group. It's so, so uplifting. And, uh, and so we are going to be live at Esalen in California, September 17th through 19th, doing our first in-person Sing the Body electric workshop. And so this is a, a workshop to get you into your body and 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 expressive from that place to really uh, make you feel safe and comfortable and confident with your own voice. Remember, because it's by our voice that we create our life. And so the more embodied and electrified and intentional and enjoyed our voices, the more power it's going to have. Um, so we also will be doing that virtually as well in October if you can't make it to Esalen. And, uh, and then another thing that's going on is we have um, virtual biofield tuning training. So 2020 forced us to bring our biofield tuning certification program online. And it's a two level training that people can, uh, can do from the comfort of their own home around the world. So if you're interested in learning biofield tuning and it's a very rewarding practice, um, then I would encourage you to check it out because now uh, we'll have our first, second part will be online in September. So uh, full certification available online now, which is great. Yeah, that sounds awesome. I definitely plan to enroll in that as soon as is possible for myself, because this has been a really useful skill set to start exploring. And there's so much to it that you can intuitively start to pick up on, especially if you have a, a history with things like for me, it was Qigong that helped me get uh, attuned to the tuning forks more easily, but still there's definitely no replacement for the years of experience and the methodical training that I'm sure Eileen has developed for people who want to jump right into this at a high level and not have to slog through all the questions and uh, discoveries that you made for us all. So definitely very appreciated all the work you do. And I think that this is going to have and already is having ripples out into the world that are part of 
changing the water level <laughs> for this next age situation. So thank you so much for being here and everybody please consider tuning in to the second hour through Rockfin or Patreon, which is linked in the show notes. And we'll be back with Eileen for the members just after this. Thanks, Eileen. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Hey, everybody. I thank and appreciate you for making it to the end of this episode. I've been excited about this one for quite a long time and kind of frantically rushing to get it out, not rushing like doing a bad job, but I just want it to the world as quick as possible because I've been dying to have the conversation myself or actually I guess living, <laughs> got to watch our words. I've been living for the day that I could talk to Eileen again and go deeper into this subject of sound healing. Anyone that's been following me this last year or two knows I'm definitely obsessed with it and have been since the first time she was on. And I'll link it in the show description, that episode, in case you didn't hear it yet, because it's just as good as this one. Who knows? You might like it better. But since I've been kind of frantic and today was oh so busy and I could use a moment to chill out, but I haven't given it to myself yet, I thought maybe we could do it together. Because we just went through a whole conversation with the tuning fork lady herself. Big thanks to Eileen. But we didn't actually play any tones, which I can now do because I've hooked up recordings of different forks to my mixer. So I think maybe about a minute or so, it would be fun to take that time to listen to some tones and see if I can chill myself out. <laughs> Bring my level of wired from too much caffeine down to a more manageable level, right? Maybe you're in the same boat as me. So here we go. I'm going to start with the tone of the sonic slider, and then I'll probably keep that one going and then layer in another tone or two. So hopefully it sounds good. And here we go. Got some good binaural action going with those tones there. So that was the Sonic Slider, which is 93.96, which is a fascinating multiple of the Schumann resonance. She took the Schumann resonance, multiplied it by 12, and that's how she came up with this low frequency for the Sonic Slider, which is something you can get from her Biofield tuning store, and I think it's people's best bet in terms of where to start. <laughs> I'd love to start getting some affiliate money for this because I've probably sold a ton of these, but I'm really into it. I think it would be something useful in everyone's toolkit. But I also hit you guys with the 528 frequency and the 417 frequency. So I wonder how those affected you for the better. Maybe it did calm you down a little bit. I feel good about it. Anyway, if you loved this conversation, now is the part where I tell you about the second hour that maybe you didn't hear yet because you tuned into the free version on YouTube or somewhere else. And the plus extension this time around was fantastic. That's kind of where I saved some of my more off the wall, weirder questions, not her normal interview type questions or things that might not be appropriate for censored channels, but. If you want to listen to those uh, amazing secondary questions, you have to get on Rockfin or Patreon, which you can do with links in the show notes. It's patreon.com slash interverse or rockfin.com slash interverse. And once $5 a month, Patreon, that gets you the access to my whole archive of plus shows. A little less easy to use than Rockfin, though. Rockfin's $10 a month, but you get everybody that's on the network, not just me. 
So pick your, <laughs> pick your plus. You can do either thing. Totally up to you. And if you do sign up or you're already a member, then you heard us talk about if improving our bioplasma and electric field health can protect us from EMF pollution. She told us about something called the sonic meridian flush technique with her weighted tuning fork. That sounded really cool. The world pain spot in the biofield and what's going on in the fields of people who have recently joined the largest unpaid medical experiment of all time. That was something people in Telegram wanted to know if that was being picked up on the forks. And, you know, it's magnetic, so seems like it would. Then we got into a lot of stuff about the throat chakra, particularly correcting negative self-talk strategies around that or for helping other people see the pattern in their speech and how that creates because the word is powerful. And also just why the tone of our speaking voice matters more than we might think. Are we monotone? Are we low and slow and sad? Are we hyper fast, high pitched? There's all kinds of things that could be going on, but you might want to hear what she has to say in terms of these varieties of ways of speaking and what it might mean for the way you manifest or how you show up to other people. And then I asked her about how alter personalities or hitchhiking entities show up in the biofield. We talked about that a little bit last time, but I had a more specific way of wording the question and I just wasn't, <laughs> I liked her answer. I wasn't satisfied with leaving it for a, a small topic. I wanted to really dive in. So we had all that and more. And then at the end, she told us a great story about using the energy of a tree to heal a wounded knee. So that's fun. Really though, nothing in any podcast that you couldn't get deeper out of her book. So I hope you guys check that out. Electric Body, Electric Health. It's on Amazon. You can get the audiobook version where she reads it. All around, all around really good stuff. And I think it's amazing how these ideas are spreading out into the world. I'm happy to be a part of informing people to start experimenting with these simple but powerful tools because we've all got a lot more potential than we let ourselves have credit for to heal ourselves. In fact, we're the only ones that can heal ourselves. And I don't know about you, but going to a doctor in a hospital seems scarier than illness at this point. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to wrap up this conversation. Really good time. And uh, yeah, check out the show notes for links to everything and also links to the plus extension and a link to the song I'm going to play us out with. It's called We Are the Energy by Metric. And it just feels so appropriate to play metric with Eileen for some reason. I like me some energetic, high-spirited drum and bass music. I don't know if she's into it, but <laughs> it feels good to me. I picked a metric song for her last show, too. So metric is awesome. M-E-T-R-I-K. I don't own the rights to the music. I'm just here to play some tunes that have good vibes and feel appropriate for what we just discussed and heard about. So if you're out there, copyright... <laughs> Monsters, don't get me for this. I'm totally just supporting somebody's music. It feels like very few podcasts take the risk of actually playing people's music on their show because there's a lot that could go wrong with that. But, you know, who knows? Someday it could get you removed from somewhere. But I'm not worried about it, especially in an episode where the guest's name actually has the word music in it. And we talk so much about how powerful and important sound is for our well-being. I think it's good for all of us to hear some new tunes now and then and promote things to each other that feel good to listen to. Because at the end of the day, if you're stuck in a loop listening to the same music forever, like some of our parents maybe do, I'm looking at you, mom, <laughs> listening to stuff from like the 60s, 70s, 80s on, on repeat, I guess 90s are in there too, forever, for decades. To me, I mean, I'm sure that people sprinkle in some other stuff too, but the more new music I can digest, the more I feel like my life is moving and grooving and shaking up and changing up. So I don't know if I got calmed down enough by those tones earlier, but I feel less wiry, <laughs> less manic, although I'm still very excited. I got to go burn this energy off at the gym while this video renders down. So yeah, check out the show notes for everything. Thanks for listening. I love you all. Join our Telegram group. It is linked in the show notes as well. And I'll catch you guys later. Much love. <laughs>